All right, good morning, guys. Let's stand and worship.
And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Your tears of joy, I lift my voice. The gray, oh death. Roll! 
is victory ahead of me. There's no looking back, no looking back. Your love defeated the enemy. Your love defeated the enemy. Now there is victory ahead of me. No looking back, there's no looking back. If you have your Bibles, would you find the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 11? 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. Just a moment, we will begin reading with verse 17. 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. As most of you are aware, we've been through a series talking about the confessions of faith that we hold to, the doctrines that we profess to believe. We've been working through those so that we kind of know as a church where we stand and why we profess certain things. Last week we began looking at the ordinances of the church. We looked into baptism last week. This week we're going to look at the Lord's Supper. Now those who've been around the church for any time at all, you've probably experienced in your church life the time when the church observed the Lord's Supper or communion, as it's often called. It's one of the two ordinances of the church. You'll remember maybe from last week, the word ordinance simply means a decree or a command. In the scriptures, we find two specific practices that Jesus decreed or commanded that the church continually or routinely engage in, observe, those being baptism and the Lord's Supper. We see not only Jesus decreeing these things be done, some specifics on how they should be done, but we see evidence throughout the New Testament that the first century church put these things into practice. Now we understand that these acts do not confer grace to anyone, They are illustrations, they are reminders of the grace of God, illustrating the redemptive work of Christ. Someone asked me after last week why we don't consider feet washing an ordinance. After all, Jesus, on the same night he instituted the Lord's Supper, washed the disciples' feet. But if you were to go back to the book of John and you were to look at that, what you would find is that although Jesus did wash the disciples' feet, He went on to explain, I have set an example for you. The example being humble service towards one another. He never actually said, do this continually. And then if you look through the rest of the New Testament, you'll never see that early church practicing that, exemplifying that. So we do not consider that an ordinance. The ordinance of the church being baptism and the Lord's Supper. Now, let's look in, let's hone in on the Lord's Supper. What is commonly called communion. Now, once again, 
the concise statement of our belief has been summed up for us already in our statement of doctrines that's recorded in the Baptist Faith and Message in Article 7. Here's what it says about the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate His second coming. So it's an act of remembrance. It's a memorial to Christ and what He's done. It focuses our attention on the supreme sacrifice that Jesus has made. It points our attention to the reality that He is going to return. You have this Lord's Supper instituted for the church to observe in obedience to His command. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Let's look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You see, the church at Corinth, it was a church that had a few problems. It was a church where people in the church said, well, I'm of Paul. Well, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. In other words, I've got my favorite preacher. And they align themselves based on their favorite preacher without unity under Christ. And this plagued the church. And they had some other issues. And it got bad enough that as they observed the Lord's Supper, they did it in an unworthy fashion. And Paul's going to speak to that. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning with verse 17. Now in giving these instructions, I do not praise you, since you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and in part I believe it. For there must also be factions among you, that those who are approved may be recognized among you. Therefore, when you come together in one place, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, each one takes his own supper ahead of others. And one is hungry, and the other is drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I do not praise you. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. But if anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment, and the rest I will set in order when I come. In other words, there's more problems you have to wait till I get there to fix. So Paul, speaking to the church of Corinth, says, look, we've got to line out some stuff here about this Lord's Supper because you have convoluted it, you have degraded it, and you have blasphemed in it, and we won't have that any longer because some of you are sick and weak and some of you have died just because of the way you're interacting at the Lord's table partaking of the Lord's Supper. So let's line it out, he says. So we see the Lord's Supper is a very serious ordinance of the church. When we observe the Lord's Supper, it's a very important thing, and Jesus has specified in his word some particulars about it that I want us to look at today. Now, just as we saw with baptism, we looked at the practice, the picture, and the purpose. I want to do the same thing for this ordinance. So let's start with the practice. The practice of communion. The practice of communion. How did the church develop this act of worship? How did the church form a tradition around this? Well, the answer is the church did not. 
The church didn't come up with communion. The church didn't establish the Lord's Supper. The church didn't form a tradition of doing this. That's not how this came to be at all. The Lord's Supper was instituted and ordained for the church by the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus Christ instituted what we call communion. He ordained the Lord's Supper for the church. This is not a man-made practice. This is not some contrived tradition of the church. This is an ordinance, a command, a decree from Jesus himself. I want you to do this, he said. Jesus started this. In fact, look at Paul's statement. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. Paul states that his explanation of the Lord's Supper comes from the Lord Jesus. Paul didn't contrive this. It was given him by the Lord. And then he gives instructions to Corinth, that church. Now, it's interesting to consider that Paul was not even an apostle when Jesus actually instituted the Lord's Supper, so he couldn't have been there firsthand to hear what was said on that night when Jesus celebrated the Passover and started this practice. Yet he says, I received from the Lord. God showed me, God told me, Jesus wanted me to be able to explain it to you because Jesus has instituted this. He has started this. He has ordained this. In fact, in verses 24 and 25, he very clearly says the command of Jesus. Twice he says that Jesus states, do this in remembrance of me. The church couldn't say that. Only Jesus could say that. And he's the one who stated it. If you look at the synoptic gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you find that Jesus established this ordinance of the church. He established the Lord's Supper as a reoccurring act of worship the church is commanded to follow. You can read about that in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22. In fact, in Luke 22, verse 19, you're going to read the exact same words that Paul says, where Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. Jesus came up with what we call the Lord's Supper. Jesus came up with what churches designate as communion. He has instituted this. And I'm sure most of you realize that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper during the Passover meal. On the night he was betrayed, Paul says here, once again, going back to the Gospels, you find this account. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he was celebrating the Passover meal, observing the Passover meal with his disciples. The Passover meal was the culmination of a week-long Jewish celebration celebrating Passover, Passover was a celebration of commemoration about how God had delivered his people out of the bondage in Egypt. You'll remember that God, while his people were in Egypt, was bringing plagues upon Egypt. And that final plague was going to be the death of the firstborn. You'll remember how God had told his people, you need to take a lamb. They would take a lamb. They, it lived with them for a time being. They had this special lamb and they sacrificed it. They took the blood of the lamb and painted on the doorpost and the lintel of the door. You'll remember how they prepared that lamb and they prepared unleavened bread. They ate it and they were ready to go at a moment's notice. As soon as God gave the command, leave, it's time to leave. And of course, that evening, as death spread across Egypt, it passed over those who were behind the blood of the lamb. God's people were freed, and then God gave them the Passover celebration to commemorate what he had done. Jesus was observing that with his disciples. And during the Passover meal, that meal that they recognized represented God's deliverance, God's deliverance through the substitutionary death of an innocent lamb, Jesus observing that memorial with his disciples changed the celebration completely. He rewrote it. He made a new commemoration. A commemoration for a new Passover. One that was about to take place because it was on the very night he was betrayed. See, Jesus established a new memorial. 
the message of this new commemoration is that God delivers from the judgment of sin by the death of an innocent substitute. And that innocent substitute is Jesus, the perfect, sinless, complete sacrifice needed and required to satisfy God's wrath over sin. Jesus, the true Passover lamb. Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And on that night, he changed the Passover celebration to commemorate a new Passover. One in which he would lay down his life for the world. One in which he became the Passover sacrifice for eternal redemption and freedom. So Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper as a memorial to the sacrificial offering of himself what was required to provide eternal deliverance for us. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. That's why we observe it. This isn't just some decision a church committee made. The head of the church, Jesus Christ, said, do this. And so we do it. Now, in God's Word, we find that the Scriptures define some specifics about practicing the Lord's Supper. There are some specific things we're told in regard to how we do this. Now, I do want you to understand, I want you to have a good understanding of this, that the Scriptures are silent on some things. God's Word is silent in regard to the frequency that you observe the Lord's Supper. There's no specific command about how often. We try to observe it quarterly here. There's nothing wrong with weekly. There's nothing wrong with twice a year. I mean, there's, the Bible doesn't say. The Scriptures also leave room for a very small degree of debate about who is eligible to partake in the Lord's Supper. But the Bible has defined some clear specific aspects to how we practice this. Let's mention these. For example, bread and juice are used as symbolic representations for the sacrificial offering that Jesus made. This is all symbolic. It's representative of the redemptive work of Christ. Once again, I refer you back to Matthew 24, Mark 14, Luke 22, or here 1 Corinthians 11. Unleavened bread is used to represent the body of Christ. The fruit of the vine represents the blood of Jesus. So the Lord's Supper does not involve fried chicken, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, whatever else. That's a church fellowship. Now, what got the church at Corinth in trouble is that they would have a big church fellowship that ended with the Lord's Supper. Only they got so busy with their fellowship that the rich folks brought in a big banquet, got there early, ate it all. The poor folks showed up with little. They went away hungry. No one esteemed anyone else. Some people getting drunk in the fellowship and doing all kinds of nonsense. And then, oh, let's have the Lord's Supper. And Paul said, oh, no, we're not having that. That, by the way, if you ever hear about the first century church having love feasts, that's what those were called. They would come together to demonstrate love for one another in fellowship, share a meal, and then worship through the Lord's Supper. That eventually went away because it just got too out of hand. But that's what was happening at Corinth. We also understand that the Bible says participation in the Lord's Supper is a solemn and reverent experience. When we observe the Lord's Supper, this isn't flippant. It's not some just roll in and act silly or whatever. This is a solemn event. It's an occasion that demands a great deal of reverence. Notice what happens. Verse 26, just look at this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. How can you be flippant if you're proclaiming the Lord's death? How can you be haphazard or casual when you're taking time to consider the Son of God died for us? The very act of partaking of this should drive you to a solemn place that fills your heart with a reverent awe for the love and grace that Jesus displayed. Just in practicing this, our hearts should be invoked to a solemn reverence to the Lord. When you really consider that Jesus was beaten beyond recognition, humiliated and suffered and died the most gruesome death ever to simply offer us forgiveness and salvation, there should be no room for silliness. 
Just the very consideration of what this means should bring us to a point of tearfulness before the Lord. Paul chastises this church because they had a lack of reverent behavior in regard to the Lord's Supper. They're proclaiming the Lord's death and doing so without reverence. And what did he say? Some of you are weak, some of you are sick, some of you died because God doesn't play with this. It's that serious. We also know that the Bible clearly teaches that the Lord's Supper should not be taken in an unworthy manner. Let's talk about that. Verse 27, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. An unworthy manner. My friends, this does not refer to being spiritually worthy. It doesn't refer to personal merit at all because the reality is this. Not a single one of us are worthy of the body and the blood of Jesus. This statement does not refer to me being spiritually worthy at all. And in fact, what we know based on Scripture is this. Those who have been redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ are declared worthy before God. And this commemoration then is for them as they commemorate what their Savior did to declare them worthy before God the Father. I'm declared blameless and innocent in God's sight through the work of Christ because his righteousness is imputed to me, applied to me. When I put my faith in him, I was forgiven of sin. I was made a new creation. His righteousness was applied to me. God looks at me through the lens of the blood of Christ, cleansed, blameless before him. And what that tells me then is this. The Lord's Supper is an act of worship only, only, only for those who have been born again through faith in Christ, but it, it commemorates what Christ has done in their life. So the Lord's Supper is very much restricted to born again believers, those who've come to faith in Christ. But Paul says we should not partake in an unworthy manner. What's he referring to? He's referring to how we approach the Lord's table. He's not referring to our personal merit. He's referring to how we individually approach the Lord's table. Do we approach with pure motives? Do we approach with a properly focused heart in participating in this? An unworthy manner really refers to the manner in which we personally relate to commemorating the atoning work of Christ. Individually, do we Come properly prepared of heart and mind to commemorate the atoning work of Christ and all that entails. Do I approach his table with the right motives and frame of mind? That's what Paul's referring to here. Now that would encompass then my attitude, my moral purity, according to what he teaches the church here, even the unity I'm in with fellow believers. Because you see, my friends, an irreverent attitude will result in me participating in this in an unworthy manner. Harboring unconfessed sin, that will lead to me participating in an unworthy manner. Discord among the church causes unworthy participation in the Lord's Supper. If you go back to verse 18, you see that Paul mentions divisions. In the Greek, that's schemata. That's where we get the English word schism. It means to have a tear, a rip. Paul says, look, as long as your church has a little tear between members, don't do it. It's unworthy for you to partake in the Lord's Supper. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, you go back and look at this in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, you're ready to worship, and you remember, oh wait, I'm out of fellowship with the brother. He said, leave your gift before the altar and go settle it with your brother, then come back and worship. You see, my friends, an unworthy manner really refers to how I approach the Lord's table. And in reality... The consideration of how I pursue biblical standards of holiness will play into this. Am I pursuing biblical standards of holiness in my life to approach the Lord's table? And what that requires of me then is something beyond a Sunday morning service. Do I esteem the body and blood of Jesus well enough that in my everyday life 
I pursue his holiness? Do I live like the devil Monday through Saturday and roll in here and just say, let me partake and put on my good show? That's what the Corinthians were doing, and that's why some of them were dead. You see, if I'm going to partake in a worthy manner, it goes beyond a a simple Sunday morning service, but am I truly dedicated to honoring the blood, the body, the sacrifice of Christ? That's why Paul says, walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Jesus gave his life to call you out of sin into the family of God. Are you living worthy of that? Is that how I'm approaching the Lord's table? I just truly believe that if a person has no regard for the sacrifice Jesus made in their daily living, they will have a hard time having the right heart of reverence when they partake of this at the church. Well, okay, we don't want to do this in an unworthy fashion. That's serious, so what's the deal? Well, for this reason, Paul says, each person should examine himself or examine herself before partaking of the Lord's Supper. Verse 28, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. There's a call for a personal assessment before we engage in the Lord's Supper. We're to have a time of personal assessment whether that's an invitation call or just where, where I know we're fixing to have the Lord's Supper and I began to assess my personal stance before God, a personal assessment of my heart, of my attitude, of my purity, of the unity. I take personal inventory. And that is actually why you've seen it, we do it every time. We always have a time of response and prayer before we do the Lord's Supper. Why? Because we want to examine ourselves. It's not a time of of come confess everything to the pastor. There's no need for that. I can't do anything for you. I can't forgive sins, but God can. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just forgives our sins. and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. It's a time where I make confession. I make confession of unconfessed sin, sin that's built in my life, sin I've been harboring. I confess maybe a a lack of fervency in living for Christ. I confess a lackadaisical attitude in serving Him daily. I confess that which needs to be confessed. It's also a time when I intentionally direct my mind to what this really means. That time of examination, that personal assessment is a time to, to... intentionally, deliberately direct my thoughts to exactly what Jesus endured and what this really represents. I move myself into a position to interact with my Savior and to commemorate, memorialize His death the way I should. That's why we have that time of examination. That's the practice. Let's look at the picture. The picture of communion. See, the Lord's Supper utilizes elements that are simply symbolic. Symbolic. This observation involves partaking in unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine. We use grape juice. And it's all symbolic. It's it's used to illustrate, to paint a picture in our minds. There's no grace conferred. This is simply an act of worship. They illustrate this supreme sacrifice offered on our behalf. They paint a visual picture of what transpired. You have the bread, and the bread represents the body of Jesus that was given to bear our sins upon the cross. That's what he says. We read it here where Paul said, Jesus said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. The Greek New Testament simply says, this is my body which is for you. But in either case, you get the implication, right? This is for you. I am giving myself for you. That's the implication there. The reality that Jesus offered himself the totality of his existence for our salvation. That's why Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, 
Jesus himself bore our sins in his own body when he hung upon the tree. That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. What Peter's explaining there is this. The perfect, sinless Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, God incarnate, entered this world, took our sin upon Himself, bore our shame, bore our guilt, took our suffering, died in our place. He offered the totality of who He was. This is my body given for you. So when we consider this, we consider Jesus Christ, Stepping into our place, bearing our sin, having the literal wrath of God poured out upon him so that we could escape that. This is my body which is given for you. Jesus humbled himself. He came in the likeness of man for us. Jesus lived a perfect life on this world for us. Jesus suffered, was humiliated, endured pain for us. Jesus died on the cross for us. This is my body, which is for you. For you. See, Jesus identified with humanity. He assumed the guilt of humanity's sin. He died as payment for us. You realize he did none of that for himself, right? This is my body, which is for you. Why does the Lord's Supper draw us to a such solemn place? Because in partaking of the bread, we get a picture of the totality of the life of Christ offered on the cross for us. We use juice. Sometimes it's called the cup. It represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for the remission of sins. Jesus shed his blood that our sin could be forgiven. The atonement of sin is what we call that. The atonement of sin required the blood of Jesus, required it to be shed. Hebrews 9.22 tells us without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There's no forgiveness. It requires the shedding of blood. The price of forgiveness then, the eternal price, is the blood of Jesus. Jesus, therefore, offered his perfect blood on the altar of heaven to make atonement for our sins. When you look at Hebrews 9, you look at verses 12, 13, 14, right through there, you find out that Jesus didn't simply die on the cross. He didn't just simply shed blood there. The Bible says he presented that blood on the altar of heaven to make eternal redemption and forgiveness it's possible. Why? Because he, not on a tabernacle made of hands, not on an altar that was earthly, but heavenly. He presented the sacrifice. Jesus shed his blood, the Bible says, to cleanse us from dead works to serve the living God. That is from death to life through the blood of Jesus. That is from being alienated from God to being a child of God. That's being dead in my sin, reborn spiritually alive all through the blood of Jesus. Jesus speaks of this being the cup, the cup of the new covenant in his blood. There was a new covenant, a new promise, something changed. What had symbolized the blood of a lamb painted on the doorpost now symbolized the blood of the Lamb of God, the Son of God, shed for the remission of sins, shed for the entire world, eternally, forever, once and for all, redemption purchased through the shed blood of Jesus. Think about it. God brought his people out of Egypt, safe behind the blood of the lamb that was sacrificed. In that wilderness journey through Moses, he gave them a law. He gave them the Mosaic law. Part of that was Levitical laws of sacrifice. He established sacrifices so that their sin could be atoned for. And year after year after year after year after year after year, they made sacrifice and sacrifice and sacrifice until finally a new Passover, a new covenant was established that said your sin is forgiven once and for all through one supremely eternal sacrifice, Jesus Christ. And now we have a new promise of God, one of forgiveness and grace through faith 
faith in Christ where I'm redeemed and I don't have to sacrifice. Jesus is sacrificed and it's settled with God. A new covenant, a new promise. One based on the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's settled. It's settled. I have the promise of forgiveness, the gift of eternal life, because Jesus shed his blood. I have a new covenant with God through Christ. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we're seeing illustrations of what it took to purchase our salvation. We're seeing a picture of what Jesus did in offering the totality of his existence and shedding his perfect blood for the price of our sin. So we see a picture. But let me wrap up. Let me wrap up with the purpose. Let's look at the purpose of communion. The purpose. You say, well, dummy, it says it right there. Do this in remembrance of me. Okay, I got you. It does, but let's talk about what that means. Let's talk about what that means. You see, the the Lord's Supper provides great benefits to the church as we observe this commemoration, this memorial of the redemptive work of Christ. We do honor Him and we are acting in obedience to Him, yes. But there are some benefits to us. For example, it helps each individual member or each individual remember, excuse me, each individual remember the redemptive work, the redemptive work of Christ. When we partake of this, what it does, it allows every single one of us individually to remember the redemptive work of Christ applied to us personally. So as we partake in the Lord's Supper, what it provides is this opportunity for me to ponder this redemptive work of Christ whereby He offered Himself for me. That my sin, every sin in the divine registry of God's record that has my name by it, He said, let me have it. And though you deserve to die, let me. So what the Lord's Supper allows me to do as an individual is to remember this atoning work of Christ applied to me. It it brings it down past the church to me. See, the purpose of the Lord's Supper is on an individual level to help each one of us draw close back in remembrance exactly what Jesus did for me. And therefore, I'm emboldened individually to live for Him. I had this renewed awareness that I'm completely unworthy of what Christ did, but He loved me enough to do it. I'm reminded again of His grace, His love, His mercy. Not only that, the Lord's Supper it directs our attention to the blessings of our living Savior who communes with us through His Spirit. In pondering what is happening and what has been done, I also recognize Jesus died for my sin, (laughs) but He didn't stay dead. He rose again. He's seated in glory right now, and He interacts with me daily by the presence of His Spirit He sent to indwell me. What a great thing to worship a living Savior. Not to follow the teachings of some prophet who died and was buried, but the Son of God who died and rose again. And the reality is, it brings this degree of joy to our hearts as we meditate on this relationship we have with God. It's afforded to us through our living Savior. So in this solemn act of commemorating what Jesus did, I'm drawn to this place of eternal joy, recognizing He lives, He lives, my Savior lives today. He walks with me, He talks with me, a long life's narrow way. What a great thing. Not only that, as we participate in the Lord's Supper, it drives our minds to the future 
when we will sit at the Lord's table at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The book of Revelation says there comes a day where God calls us to His table. Jesus says, Come to my table to dine. And it won't be a little unleavened wafer. It won't be a little cup of cringy juice. It'll be a a full, a full banquet. It'll be a feast. Come and dine, the master calleth. Come and dine, he'll say. We look forward to that day with this confident hope of the future that Jesus has promised he's coming again. He's going to gather his bride, the church, and he's going to welcome us to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We'll be in his presence eternally. What a thing to ponder. And that's available to me because of what he did on the cross. One last purpose it really helps us with. It serves to promote unity as we recognize the family of faith that unites to carry out this act of worship. You realize the Lord's Supper, this ordinance, is carried out in a body of believers, a family of faith. And so just in the very act of doing this with my family of faith, it draws my attention to this family of faith that God has brought me in unity with. What a great thing to belong to a community of faith that can celebrate something like this together. So really, as I consider the Lord's Supper, friends, participation in the Lord's Supper demands that we consider who we are in Christ based on His death, His burial, His resurrection. Is He my Lord and Savior? Participation in this should produce a heart of reverence and worship within me. And each time as a church we observe the Lord's Supper, we do look back to the cross. We look back to the fact Jesus bore our sins. We look up to our exalted Savior who's living. He's in glory. He has sent His Spirit to indwell us. We look forward to the day when He returns. We look around at our family of faith that Jesus has unified us into. And we do it all for the glory of Jesus. I wonder today, can you approach the Lord's table? Can you say, I'm a born-again believer in right standing with Jesus, I can approach His table? You see, this is a commemoration for children of God redeemed through Christ. It could be you've never come to the place where you've called out to Jesus and said, Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for me, that you rose again. I believe that you're the one who can forgive me and give me eternal life. And Jesus, right now I'm asking, will you come into my life? Will you forgive me? Jesus, I want you to be my Savior. It could be you need to do that. And when you do that, this is for you. Maybe you're here and you say, I'm born again. I know I am. But I'm not living in obedience. I, I, I need to confess a few things before the Lord because I want to approach His table with pure motives and the right attitude. Today may be the day you need to do that. Maybe you need to line up your baptism. Brother Anthony's got his lined up. We'll be doing it soon. Maybe you need to schedule two. Maybe there's something God's been calling you to do in life and you've been hesitant on it and you need to lay it before him today and say, God, I know you've been moving me to do this and I've been hesitant, I've been holding back, but, but Jesus, forgive me for that and give me the courage to move forward. I'm ready. Maybe you just need to direct your heart and your mind and say, God, Instill within me right now the proper attitude I need to have to approach the Lord's table.